praise the Lord. Let's go ahead and pray, everybody. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you for this day. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. Thank you that it goes forth with boldness, simplicity, and power that ministers grace to our hearing. And Lord, that it fills us up in such a way that uh, we're not only uh, filled and, and equipped, but we are also able to share it out with others, that others may come to know you and to love you as we do. And we give you praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, for, for those of you that y'all haven't been here in a bit, like we're kind of walking through Romans chapter 8. And, and there's a very specific reason I have in mind for that, because I believe that Romans chapter 8, it begins with one of the most powerful passages of Scripture. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk after the Spirit and not after the flesh. That, you know, I, I really believe that if we just got our mind wrapped around that one single passage of Scripture, that the body of Christ would be transformed. Because when you are in Christ, condemnation ends. Condemnation ends. There is no more judgment for the child of God. Because your judgment was in Christ on the cross. Now, there are some people that will teach you that, well, you got to do this and do that. You have to do things to, to, uh, to uh, maintain and to retain your salvation. But you don't. Because if there's things that you have to do to maintain or retain your salvation, then that means that God alone is not enough. And, and it's, it, it has absolutely nothing to do with us, but everything to do with him. Amen? Amen. So we, we started off, um, you know, talking about, um, you know, no condemnation. And then we talked about um, uh, the, the, uh, the insufficiency of the law. And um, today I want, to, um, I want to talk about the realm of the mind. And, and, I, and I really I struggle with trying to find... Uh, I guess a title for the message because it, it's not it's not so much a battle for the mind as as it is understanding which mind is in you. See, the, the thing is, is that you can have something in you and not be aware of it. It takes something to awaken it. it it's like. Everybody is born with like a heart and lungs and, and all of these internal organs and they all work together. But there are some people that are able to run marathons. Now listen, everybody can't run a marathon. But at some point, the marathon or something inside them is quickened or awakened to say that this thing I can do. And, and once that thing is quickened, now they know that they can do it and they do it. And, and once they begin to do it, they realize that it's effortless because it's something that they themselves didn't produce, they themselves didn't cultivate, it was there all along. All, you, all, all that happened was that it was awakened in you. So we have to know which mind is in us. And so I want to, um, if, you, if you have your Bibles, if you turn to Romans chapter eight, and um, we're going to go uh, verses 6 through 13. 6 through 13. And I'm, I'm reading from the Amplified. Um, Romans chapter 8, verses 6 through 13. And it says, Now the mind of the flesh, which is sense and reason without the Holy Spirit, is death. Death that comprises all the miseries arising from sin both here and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace both now and forever. That is because the mind of the flesh with its carnal thoughts and purposes is hostile to God. For it does not submit itself to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. So then those who are living, in the, life, living the life of the flesh, that is catering to the appetites and impulses of their carnal nature, cannot please or satisfy God or be acceptable to him. 
But you are not living the life of the flesh. You are living the life of the spirit. If the Holy Ghost, the spirit of God, really dwells within you, directs and controls you, that is. But if anyone does not possess the Holy Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. He does not belong to Christ and is not truly a child of God. But if Christ lives in you, then although your natural body is dead by reason of sin and guilt, the spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he imputes to you. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Jesus from the dead will also restore life to your mortal, that is short-lived and perishable bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. So then, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh or to our carnal nature to live a life ruled by the standards set up by the dictates of the flesh. For if you live according to the dictates of the flesh, you will surely die. But if the power of the Holy Spirit, well, but if through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to get to death, making extinct, deadening the evil deeds pr prompted by the body, you shall really and genuinely live forever. Now, the, the first thing is, is that the flesh mind is carnal. And I've talked about this word and I want to reemphasize it because this word is really important. Anybody ever see like a can of Hormel chili con carne? You know, that chili con carne means chili with meat. Because the word carnal comes from the Greek word sarx, which basically means meat or flesh. So if you're carnally minded, you're a meathead. That's, that's really what it comes down to. In, in other words, you're thinking with your flesh bag instead of your spirit man. That's what it comes down to. And so what we need to do is we need to get past uh, thinking, with our, thinking with our feelings. Because our, our feeler is going to fail us. The, that's what the body is. The, our, our flesh is our feeler. Because it feels things. It smells things. It hears things. It tastes things. It touches things. That's what the flesh does. And if we rely on that, we're not relying on faith. We're relying on the feeler. And see, the faith is spiritual, but our feeler is our flesh. So we have to get, uh, get past the point where we're dependent upon our feeler. Everybody with me? Okay. So the next thing is that um, you, you have to know that your flesh is doomed to die. Flesh doesn't know anything but to die. From the moment that it's born, it begins the process of dying. It, it, is, it is conceived of the dust of the earth and it goes, returns to the dust of the earth. And that's all it knows how to do. That's all it can do. So if we're operating in flesh, we're operating in death. And, and the thing, I've, I've said this before, that in life, you have two things that you can do. You can either choose to be living or you can choose to be dying. And, and when you choose to be dying, you're choosing the things of the flesh. You're choosing the things of death. You're choosing death. That's what you're choosing. But if you're choosing the spirit, you're choosing life because the spirit is life. It's the spirit of Christ in us that quickens our mortal bodies. It is the power that raised Jesus from the dead that dwells in us that quickens our mortal bodies and empowers our spirits. So we have to have the mind. Of the spirit. Now let me say this too, because going back to uh, Romans eight and one, that when when they say that is therefore now no condemnation to those who are uh, who are in Christ Jesus who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. What people think is that that is a uh, is a um, a disjointed statement. In other words, that those who are in Christ Jesus and who walk after the spirit and not after the flesh. See, and, and, it's, and it's, it's actually, if you are in Christ Jesus, the moment that you're born again, you stop walking in the flesh. Listen, only sinners, only people outside of Christ walk in the flesh. Once you're born again, you're walking in the spirit. Now, does that mean that you're walking right? 
No, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily mean that. Because see, here's the thing, like a toddler is a human being. But a toddler begins to walk and the toddler stumbles and falls. That's what they do. But here's what happens is that at, over time, they begin to renew their minds. That is to change their mind about falling so that they don't fall anymore. Because they make the decision that this thing that caused me to fall, I'm not going to do anymore. So it's like a baby will start running and what they do is if you, if you notice, babies will lean forward, they'll lean far forward and they get on their toes and they take off running. And what, what this does is that they don't stabilize their center of gravity. They're kind of leaned over their center of gravity. So they run and they stumble and they fall. And so what happens is, is the baby begins to realize, okay, I'm leaning too far forward. Let me straighten my posture and then run. And then they realize, oh my goodness, now I can run without falling. That's amazing. So what they've done is they've repented. They've changed their mind. They've renewed their mind. And, and so when you, when you are in Christ Jesus, you may stumble, and that's okay. You may fall, and that's okay. The problem is, is that when you decide that you're going to stay down, when you stay down, now you failed. Because what you've done is you trusted in your own ability instead of in Christ. Because if you know Christ is in you, know, then you know that the same, if Jesus, if this same power could raise Jesus from the dead, it could certainly get you up out of your situation. And that's, that's really important to remember. In verse 7, it says that, the, that the, 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 the flesh mind is hostile to God. Okay, hostility toward God does not equal God hostile toward us. That is something that you have to understand. You know, because see, people think, well, if you're in sin or if you, stump, if you stumble and you're in sin, then God is angry at you and God is going to get you. God's going to do something to straighten you out. God's going to hit you. He's going to smite you. He's going to take something. He's going to move something. Something he's going to do to try to get your attention. God, listen, God doesn't need to get your attention that way. He doesn't need to get your attention that way. If you go back to Luke chapter 4, when, uh, when, when uh, the, the shepherds um, are, actually it's not Luke, it's Luke chapter 2, um, that when um, the, the angels are speaking to the shepherds, it said, peace on earth, goodwill toward men, toward men, toward men. It's God. That was the shepherd, the, the angels coming to the shepherds and heralding the fact that God is no longer at enmity with man. That the advent of Jesus changed everything. That God is no longer ticked off with you. God is no longer angry with you. God is no longer going to get you because you do this, that, or the other. And I'm going to tell you something. See, this is where the, 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 uh, the good news is, even for the sinner. Because, see, God is not the one that's going to get you. Sin will judge itself. Just like gravity will judge you if you jump off this building. So the, the carnal mind is at enmity with God. But watch this, right? If God dwells in us, do you think that God is going to dwell in a place where there is enmity against him? Do you think that God is going to dwell in a place that is hostile toward him? No. The first thing that happens is that you begin, you're, you, you receive the mind of Christ. You have to have the mind of Christ in order to have the occupation of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit can't dwell in an unclean place. So that means God has to clean up everything before he moves in. He's got to clean the joint up before he can come in and take residence. So God is not at enmity with us. And for the born again believer, the born again believer is not at enmity with Christ. So therefore, you cannot be carnally minded 
if you're born again. You can't be walking after the flesh if you're born again. Can you have a fleshly moment? Absolutely, because you're in the flesh bag. And, and flesh do what it do. But are you fleshly minded? And the answer is no. Now, verse 9, I want to talk about this. The Holy Spirit is the evidence of Christ in you. It's the evidence that, that it, it's the, the Holy Spirit is the, is the evidence of your, of your being born again. Now, does this mean that you're speaking in tongues and, and, you know, prophesying and all of that stuff? No, those are gifts, and that's a whole different lesson. You know, do we pray in tongues? Absolutely. But, but as far as like speaking in tongues publicly, you know, it, it's like one of these things that's funny how, because Paul talks about uh, speaking in tongues and having to have an interpreter. If someone's speaking in tongues publicly, like if I, if I stand up here and speak in tongues, there should be somebody here to interpret what I've just said so that everybody else will understand it. If there is no one here to, to interpret it, then I'm out of order. Okay, so that's not the evidence of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to tell you all what the evidence of the Holy Ghost is. And it comes, it always comes back to this thing. John 13, 34, 35. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, that you have what? That you have what? That you have what? Now, this is the interactive part of the service, y'all. Y'all get what? You, what? Love. Love. Love one for another. So if you don't have love, then the Holy Spirit ain't in you. And if you want to know whether somebody is really a Christian or not, look at, look at how they love. Because you can't you can be a Christian. Listen. Mm. You can't be a Christian if you say, I, 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 hate, uh, I hate refugees from the Middle East. You can't be a Christian if you say, I hate people from south of the border. You cannot be a Christian. If, if, that, if, that's, if that's what's in your heart, then love is absent. Now, do you, do you take precautions against, you know, against somebody you know, uh, abusing a privilege? Absolutely. But you don't, just absolutely, you don't just simply disregard somebody or prejudge them because of where they're from. Or for that matter, what they believe. It, it is your identity as a Christian is, de is defined entirely by your love. If there's no love, by definition, you're not a Christian. Okay. Now that I made a whole bunch of people mad, let me move on. So the spirit man lives in the flesh, but not for the flesh. You know, basically the spirit, the, the carnal man says that it's trying to fulfill its fleshly desires. It wants to taste what tastes good, smell what smells good, touch what feels good, listen to what sounds good. That's what the, that's what the flesh wants to do. Now, watch this. Here's where it gets really interesting because God deals with the desires of our hearts. So God is not going to withhold anything. The Bible says he will withhold no good thing from those who walk uprightly before him. Now we're in Christ, so that means we're walking uprightly. Okay? So if we're walking uprightly, God is not going to, he's not going to take anything from us. He's not going to deny us anything. But what, here, here's the difference. Is that the flesh wants what it wants because it wants it. And it wants what it wants when it wants it. What the Holy Spirit does is it begins to govern your desires. In other words, the Holy Spirit will give you new desires. And, and it doesn't take away from the, the ability or, or your desire to smell things that smell good or anything like that. And God will provide those things. You think about it. Your, your flesh likes to smell things that smell good. God gave us flowers. I mean, it's... It, it, God's not going to withhold any good thing. He's, you know, we like good tasting food. God's not going to give us garbage. That's crazy. God is going to give us good tasting food. That's why God gave us bacon. 
Glory to God. <laughs> now, verse 10. Your spirit is alive because you've been made righteous. Oh, boy. That one verse by itself will preach all by itself. That one verse will write books all by itself. That you've been made righteous. That lines up with 2 Corinthians 5 and 21. That the, we have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We have been, have been, done deal. There, look, you know, uh, it, it's funny how like in the, uh, it, I think it's Proverbs 21 and 21. It tells us that we're supposed to pursue righteousness. But in verse 10 here in the 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, it says that we possess righteousness. See, the thing is, you don't have to pursue what you possess. And, and that's where we get messed up because, see, we get on the treadmill of religion because we start running after something that we already have. Now, here's the thing. You know, Angela is my bride. That's my wife. And I had to court her in order to get her to marry me. But now I got her. She's back there shaking her head now. But but here's but but watch this. Watch this. You know, I'm I'm not trying to be husband to her. I'm being husband to her. And so because I have get it down in my spirit that I'm being because I am her husband I be her husband and I do the things that husbands should do I'm not trying to pursue her I'll continue to woo her I'll continue to give her shiny stuff <laughs> but I don't have to pursue her she's mine now Y'all follow what I'm saying? It's like you don't you don't have to pursue what you already have. It's like you know if you have if you have this desire for a dream car or a desire for a dream house. Once you get the house, you don't keep going to house hunting. Once you have your dream house, you're 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 there. You possess the land. You don't have to pursue it anymore. That that right there. I mean, it's like I could I could stop preaching right there and we'd be we, we'd be uh, absolutely full. Now, we're going to slide down to verse 12. It says that we're debtors to the flesh, or that, that we were debtors to the flesh. Um, look here. You, we're, we're not, the Bible says that we're not to owe any, anybody anything but to love one another. That's, that's the law that God has written in our hearts, the law of love. We don't owe anybody anything. And so since we don't owe anybody anything, we don't owe our flesh anything. We don't owe our flesh any, we don't have to give our flesh any credit for anything. Because here's the thing, that the law was weakened by the flesh. Now watch this. If the law was weakened by the flesh, if you owe your flesh, if you act as if you owe your flesh something, you not only owe the flesh, but you owe the law. So you're in debt in two places. Because y'all know what the law is? The law is God's bill collector. How many of y'all like bill collectors? <laughs> Let everybody keep your hands squarely in your lap. Bill collectors are not fun. And when you have to deal with them, it's a difficult situation. The law is God's bill collector. But watch this. Jesus came. And he spoke to your bill collector and said, your debt is satisfied. He paid the bill so that you're no longer beholden. You're no longer beholden to the law, so you're no longer beholden to your flesh. It is because you've been bought with a price. Therefore, you are his. You are a child of God. You belong to him. You're no longer a child of your flesh. You're no longer a child of this world, but you belong to him. And because you belong to him, you have been you've been taken out of slavery and delivered into liberty. See that, that see y'all gotta catch that because see when the, the law says do this, do this, do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, do this, do this, and, and it's all these do's and don'ts. 
Liberty just says love. You know, you, and, and, and I'm going to tell you something. This is where the body of Christ gets tripped up and stumbled and messed up so often because I'm going to tell you something. By and large, Christians think like slaves. You know, and, and uh, we just celebrated this uh, this thing. And it began in Texas called Juneteenth, the June nineteenth, eighteen sixty, was it eighteen sixty five? Basically, um, Lincoln had emancipated the slaves in eighteen sixty three, but the, the 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 slaves in Texas didn't know that they were free until two years later. Word didn't get to them. Do y'all realize that right now that it, we are we are in that period between the emancipation? The emancipation happened at the cross, and, and somewhere along the line, all the slaves are going to realize that they're free. And we're in that period. We're in that period where all the slaves haven't been. They, they didn't get the memo. They didn't get the memo. They don't know that it's like you're free, but you don't know it. You, you, you have the complete run of the country. You have complete liberty. You have complete access. Everything that you need, but you don't realize it. And because you don't realize it, you still think like you're on the plantation. The idea is, is that we got to get people to, to walk in liberty. Now, when you are spirit-minded, when you are born again, and, and let me say this, people say that we have a sin nature, that we have to, we have to contend with the sin nature. But, but the Bible says that, that we've been made a new creature in Christ Jesus. In becoming a new creature, you receive a new nature. That what was natural to you before is no longer natural to this new creature. So the, 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 the nature of the flesh that you had as a sinner, you no longer have as a saint. Your nature is no longer to sin. Your nature now is to righteousness. And that is where the mind of Christ comes in. See, here's the thing. When Paul said that we have the mind of Christ, he didn't say some of y'all have the mind of Christ. He didn't say the churchgoers have the mind of Christ. He didn't say the super saints have the mind of Christ. He didn't say the people who read their Bible and pray faithfully have the mind of Christ. Every believer who is born again has the mind of Christ. Every single one. And if you have the mind of Christ, then that means you understand the will of God. Listen, Ephesians 5 and 17, it says, be ye not unwise, understanding what the will of the Lord is. Y'all got to really catch what that means because it says, be ye not unwise. That means that if you don't understand the will of the Lord, you are unwise. You're ignorant. And the mind of Christ is key to understanding the will of God. I, you know, I, I, I get so frustrated, and I, I'm at the point now, like, whenever I preach a funeral, you know, I, I'm, I'm always very particular to say that, you know, for all of you that say, well, you know, you we, God's ways are higher than ours and we can't understand the will of God and all of that. Uh, the first thing I do is I, I kind of set, I do all over the housekeeping and I say that that's absolutely wrong because we can't understand the mind of Christ. In fact, it tells us that, it, that if we don't understand the will of God, then we're unwise. So his thoughts, see, in the Old Testament, you didn't have the Holy Spirit. That's why Isaiah said his, his thoughts are higher than ours and our, our ways are not his ways. And you can say all that because we didn't have the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit now is dwelling inside of us and we have the mind of Christ. He said, let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. See, if that mind is in you, if that's the mind that's dwelling in you, 
then you'll understand his will. In other words, understanding his will is very simple. You want to know what understanding his will is? Being able to interpret his word. Real simple. Real simple. Not complicated at all. But if we, if, listen, if you, if you walk around with this idea that, uh, well, I, I'm, 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 I'm just wretched, I'm just a worm, I'm just a sinner, and, and listen, th then you're not going to get the things that God has for you. Even though he wants to give them to you, even though he wants to bless you, even though he wants to reveal things to you, he will not because you're operating in a double-minded capacity. You have to operate in his mind, in his thoughts. That's what you have to operate under. It, it, is, it, is, it is having the mind of Christ. So, so here's the thing about this passage of Romans. This section is dealing with the mind. And we have to get past what our, you know, listen, when, when you, if you have a change of career, if you go from being a teacher to an attorney, you cannot have the teacher mentality when you go into the courtroom because if you do that, you're going you're gonna to wind up in legal malpractice because you're going to mess somebody's case up because you have to have the mind of an attorney. If you're if, if, if any any change in your life, like if you're if you're single, if you go into in, in the marriage with the mind of a single person, you are going to wind up divorced because you didn't let this mind be in you that was necessary for marriage. Are you with me, y'all? We we have the 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 mind that we the mind that we cling to is the mind that we operate in. And yes, the mind of Christ it may be in you, but if you don't know it's there, it, it doesn't it doesn't do you uh, it doesn't do you any good. You know, it, it's like um, uh, you know, Angie's car, <laughs> it doesn't have like an owner's manual, like a book. It, it, the owner's manual is, made, is built into the into the computer, into the um, like the navigation sc screen, and 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 there are so many things that that this car can do. But if you never go through and look in in the book, you'll never realize all the things that it can do. It, it's like it's in there, but you haven't accessed it. It has this capability. But you're not using it. You've been given this, but now you have to access it. You have it, now you have to possess it. You have to walk in it. You have to appropriate it. You have to make it yours. And see, God will give you things. That's, that's just like salvation. God makes salvation available to everyone. But not everybody receives it. And even those who receive it don't fully appropriate it. And you can and, and the proof of that is, is that the things that happen in the first century church don't happen today. <laughs> you know, the, the, the healings, the deliverances, and all of this stuff. Man, it's like we should be seeing the world turn right side up by everything that we know. And that ain't happening. And it's not happening because people have it, but they don't know it. Are you with me? So I pray that that blesses you. Um, it's, you, 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 have to, you have to know, know that you know that you know that you have what you have. And, and I want y'all to remember one thing. You, God is not at enmity with you. No matter how many times you trip, stumble, or fall. Even no matter how many times you cuss, smoke, or chew, or run with someone who do. That God ain't mad at you. God loves you. And God wants to bless you. But you just have to put on his mind and not yours. Amen.